If you're gonna feed all the squirrels, you have to feed the rats too. You have to make a happy ecosystem. I sound insane, and that's okay, all right? We're talking about the foods that are gonna improve your gut diversity. Okay, I've talked about in many videos that a diverse microbiome is a good microbiome, but we don't just get a diverse microbiome by eating like random foods that are diverse, okay? We have to eat different kinds of fiber, and I'm not talking about just soluble versus insoluble. I'm gonna give you a list of the best fibers that you can eat to ultimately get the most diverse gut that you could possibly get. Okay, so I'll break it all down, but first a quick little backstory to have it all make sense. Okay, after today's video, I finally launched my truffles through Thrive Market. So Thrive Market is an online membership-based grocery store. So you can do all your grocery shopping and all that fun stuff, but I've created some cool truffles. So I've got hazelnut pecan crunch and I've got a hazelnut mocha. So these are all made with really delicious, ethically sourced ingredients. So we've got pecan butter and hazelnut butter and a bunch of other naturally sourced ingredients, including natural sweeteners that are not using any sugar at all. So we're using things like allulose, which are huge in the world of sweeteners because we're getting an effect that also modulates glucose in addition to not having a glycemic impact. So for those that are watching their blood sugar or just trying to eat a little smarter, these are perfect. So that link is down below and you get 30% off your entire grocery order through Thrive Market and you can use that 30% towards these truffles if you wish. Now I also have my nut butters if you still wanna try those as well. All those are linked down below for people that are already Thrive Market members. Otherwise, that link to become a member is in the top line of the description underneath this video. Imagine you had a forest, okay? And in that forest, you had equal amounts of rats and equal amounts of squirrels, okay? They both come with good and bad traits. But then you threw like 100 tons of walnuts into the forest. Well, the squirrels can eat a bunch of those nuts. They can eat the walnuts because they can break it open and get to the nut, right? The rats, unfortunately, cannot. So what ends up happening? The squirrels take over and the rats slowly die off. Now, there's lots of good attributes about squirrels. They're cute, they're fuzzy, they're on cartoons, they're cool, they seem like they have some good senses of humor, I don't know, okay? But they're also a lot of bad attributes. So the point is, is when you feed one kind of fiber into your body, it seems like it's a good thing, but we really have to make sure we're diversifying the kinds of fiber we get. And when we look at a nutrition label, we see fiber. We don't see what kind of fiber, and it's up to us to educate ourselves to get those right kinds of fibers. So there was a real world study that kind of looked at this almost like walnut thing, right? It was published in Scientific Reports. Okay, they took a look at individuals and they gave them uh, just a bolus of either fructo-oligosaccharides or galacto-oligosaccharides. So basically just different kinds of prebiotic fibers that come from fruits and veggies versus galacto-oligosaccharides, which come from like beans and lentils and stuff like that. Okay, so they give them 16 grams a day of these specific fibers. And they found that both groups ended up with this huge increase in bifidobacterium, which isn't a bad thing. Bifidobacterium is good, but they had a tremendous decrease in a lot of these other bacteria that typically would produce what are called short chain fatty acids. Now, what that means in layman's terms is a lot of the bacteria that truly have a good end result ended up just slowly dying off because it got overrun with this bifidum bacterium. It's not that bifidum bacteria is bad, it's just it overrun it and there's only so much space, right? So the other ones slowly die off. Anyhow, just a real world example, but let's jump into this, uh, the foods itself. At the end of the day, the most bang for the buck is gonna come from resistant starches. Resistant starches are highly fermentable forms of fiber. And technically, they're like not even fibers. They're just forms of starches that ferment. And when you have this heavy fermentation, it can give you a little gas, it gives you a little bloating, but eventually you adjust to it. But also what happens is it allows for the breakdown to kind of like go off into these tangents and grow diverse bacteria. So instead of throwing 100 tons of walnuts into the, uh, the forest for the squirrels, you're putting a small factory that can create 20 different things, making all of the ecosystem happy, which is exactly what we're kind of looking for. So the resistant starches that you wanna have small amounts of to start, you know, things like green plantains. And I recommend having like a quarter of a green plantain. Even if you are doing low carb, it's fine because a lot of these carbohydrates aren't gonna get metabolized properly. They're not going to contribute to blood glucose levels. Okay, uh, an unripe banana, very, very similar, right? Same kind of thing. 
Okay, a sweet potato or part of a sweet potato that has been heated and then has been cooled. Okay, same thing with like a red potato that has been heated and has been cooled. Yes, you have some amnesty that is granted as far as your carb count with these foods, but that's really not the benefit that we're after. We're after the fact that it can ferment and it can ultimately help your gut bacteria out. Another one that's popular is cashews, believe it or not, raw cashews, but I have a little bit of a beef with cashews just because the phytic acid content and stuff like that, but it's worth mentioning out there, right? The other one is going to be cooled oats. Again, not the biggest fan of having oats because I don't like having a bunch of grains, but that's just my own personal bias with some research there. The fact is, if you cook some oats, you let them cool, you only need a small amount to get a highly fermentable carbohydrate that is going to support the gut microbiome, as demonstrated in a study that was published in MBio. See, the journal MBio, they published that all it takes was just a small amount of these fermentable resistant starches to increase short chain fatty acid content by 31%. That is unheard of. That is 31% shift in your entire microbiome just by adding resistant starches in. So if you want to try to experience what it feels like to have a more diverse gut microbiome, you may want to try some of these resistant starches. Okay, the next one I want to talk about is inulin. And inulin sounds like this like individual thing, but there's actually various forms of inulin. We just know of inulin as like when we look at a label and we see, oh, there's inulin in it. And we kind of see it as a bad thing sometimes because we associate it with bloating. That's not always the end of the world. So I want to get into that in a second. So back to inulin. If we look at inulin, okay, there's a study that was published in a journal Metabolism that found that just a single 24 gram dose of inulin increased short chain fatty acid levels. That is insane. One dose, okay, one 24 gram dose. Granted, that's a good amount, but you're gonna get that in some really good foods. And that improves short chain fatty acid levels. But then when you look at the British Journal Nutrition study, you find that, okay, if you have like 10 grams over the course of a few weeks, you have this radical shift in your entire gut microbiome. Everything changes in three weeks. Like, again, that's because it's a different kind of fiber. So what kind of foods are we going to get uh, in the way of inulin? Like, where, how are we gonna extract that? We're talking artichoke. Artichoke is like the big mama jama of the inulin world because it has one that's called very long chain inulin. So it breaks down and ferments a little bit different. Then we have asparagus, which I'm always talking about as like the ultimate low carb vegetable. Then we have garlic, we have onions, we have leeks, which again, like make a leek soup with some broth. So like it's phenomenal for this kind of stuff. And then we have chicory root, which again, like in the processed food world, it gets a bad rap because people are like, oh, I don't want chicory root. Why? Because when it's combined with a bunch of other garbage, it, yeah, it will bloat you. But straight up chicory root is fine. You should just be having small, small amounts of it, okay? So again, it kind of comes down to like these chocolates, these bars, these things that have inulin or they have chicory root in them. A lot of times if they have inulin, they usually do have chicory root, okay? They're getting their inulin from chicory root. You just have to have it in small amounts. That's why you get bloated. And when they're combined with sugar alcohols, that's when you run into a problem, okay? Now the next category is going to be pectins. Okay, pectins are gonna come from like the uh, skin of citrus fruits, right? So like if you were to skin in a, a lemon and put it into the zest into something, cook it into your baked goods, whatever. Okay, the pectin creates a gel-like substance and that is what is gonna potentially control the amount of cholesterol that gets absorbed as well. So people that are modulating that or controlling that a little bit may wanna consider this, okay? Also, the fact that it's a soluble fiber, it ends up having a good contribution to your short chain fatty acid levels as well. Okay, then there's a whole different category that isn't talked about that much, and that's coming from the things like the mushrooms, okay? Beta-glucans. Okay, beta-glucans have a different process within the body. They actually can operate as a signaling device and, and do some pretty powerful things. But the cool thing is, outside of just contributing to good short-chain fatty acid levels and a diverse microbiome, they also stimulate what is called glucagon-like peptide 1. Now, if you've ever been like really hungry before, glucagon-like peptide 1 can actually satiate you by improving what's called peptide YY, but we'll go down a rabbit hole with that one. Okay, essentially what you are getting is you're getting improved insulin sensitivity. That's happening directly from these beta-glucans, but also indirectly from what they're doing within the gut. Okay, so mushroom, but another one, seaweed and algae. Okay, what do they all kind of have in common? Have you ever left mushrooms in the fridge? like for a little too long, they get slimy. They get a little slimy, okay? And when you eat a mushroom, you can kind of feel it slither down your throat. There, I just ruined mushrooms for you. But you can kind of feel that, right? Same kind of thing. If you put some algae or some seaweed in your mouth, you let it sit for a minute, it gets kind of slimy. Those are the beta-glucans. They're slimy characters, but they do a good job. Sometimes slimy is good, right? You just gotta weigh it out. So diversity is what we're after. 
But you don't just go eat Mexican food one day, Asian food another day, Indian food another day, and say that you're diverse, okay? You have to consciously be thinking about the different fibers that are gonna contribute to your good overall health, right? But at the end of the day, it's a lot of work. So here's a list for you. I'll see you tomorrow.